Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, it's great to see you today on this cold and blustery day. Today, we'll talk about the great transition. Did you know that we're in the midst of a great transition? We're at the starting line of something new. Well, we're starting to see the acceleration of history where 50 years of change are getting compressed into a decade. With energy, you can see glimpses of this great transition looking around the world, whether it's in South Australia, where now wind-generated electricity is greater than coal-generated electricity. And even if the coal itself were free, solar power would still be cheaper. In the 100 plus cities worldwide that are now getting over 70% of their electricity from renewable energy. Or look at Spain, where wind power is closing in on nuclear generation. Or in China, where wind generated electricity is already greater than nuclear generated electricity. In the UK, uh, wind generated electricity is eclipsing coal on some days and after 115 years of burning coal, Scotland just recently burned its last lump of coal as it moves forward in this transition. So each month we're seeing new renewable energy records set um, and it's exciting to think about. You know, we know energy transitions themselves are not new. How many people got here by a horse and buggy? Or are these lights powered from whale oil? Certainly not. Um, but this, this energy transition is happening in our lifetimes and, and it's incredibly exciting. So before we get into the nitty gritty on energy, um, why don't we talk a little bit about why we care, why we're interested in this. And um, we can start with some small talk. How about we talk about the weather? Well, today is uh, one of the coldest days of the year. Uh, we're hearing about this meandering polar vortex, where as the Arctic is warming up and the jet stream is getting a little bit wavier, uh, colder air is, is slipping down into the continental United States. Uh, where, whereas meanwhile, in Australia, they're having record high temperatures. And you can talk to kindergartners in Australia now who do not know rain because there's been a drought their entire lifetimes. In the US, of course, we've had our own recent experience with drought and wildfires on the West Coast. And overall, at the global level, we know that the 11 warmest years on record have all come since 2005. And this is because Carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are rising at un un unprecedented rates, largely from burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, also the destruction of our forests. So what does this mean for, for you and me? Well, climate change affects us in many different ways. Most intimately, perhaps, is with our food supply. So you look at this ear of corn, we're all familiar with corn. Many of us eat it, enjoy it on the summer. Uh, we eat quite a bit of corn if you have a typical American refrigerator that you open up and you see your milk, eggs, maybe some hamburger. All those are embodied corn. Now what, what has to happen for this corn to grow? Well, each one of those kernels um, is, has, has, is attached to those tassels you see. And grains of pollen have to fall down, make their way down to the tassel, every single one to produce each of those little kernels of corn. So that's great when you have good temperatures and lots of water. Um, it's easy to get juicy, plump ears of corn. But in years of drought, those tassels shrivel and corn pollination can fall to zero. Now you may say, well, I don't eat very much corn, and that may be true, but these same challenges of high temperatures and pollination shortfalls happen with all the major uh, grains that are feeding much of humanity, uh, corn, wheat, and rice. 
If you look around the world and you see how well we're doing at growing crops, our yields of crops, how much you can get for every given acre. Um, since World War II and throughout this green revolution, we've seen crop yields in many parts of the world start to increase um, for a number of reasons, new varieties, um, where you can grow plants closer and closer together. Um, but in many parts of the world, the growth in yield is slowing. So this shows us Japan and China. Now Japan has some of the most experience of anybody in growing rice. They probably do it, um, some of, they have some of the best rice farmers in the world, but they're not making much more progress in getting more rice per given acre. Now China, which you know, the most populous country in the world, is nearing Japanese levels in yields. And you can see this if you look around the world with wheat in Europe's major producers who are hitting that yield ceiling. Um, it's sort of like a, a biophysical limit where you look at runners, you know, nobody's talking about the next three minute miler. There's some limits uh, in, in the system. Other ways we're, we're seeing the effects of climate change are with the melting of ice in the ice caps and ice floating in the seas. Now when sea ice melts, that doesn't directly raise sea level because that ice is already floating. But when Greenland or the West Antarctic ice sheet start to melt, that additional water can raise, raise sea level. And projections are showing that by the end of this century, sea level could rise on the order of a meter or more, three feet or more. That means inundation in coastal cities already. Um, parts of the United States even are seeing these regular nuisance floods on sunny days in Miami. You may see streets start to get flooded as the seas are, are higher already because warmer water expands. Ice is also melting in the world's mountains. We can call these our, our reservoirs in the sky, sky. Mountain glaciers are melting um, throughout the world. Now in the short term, that increases the flows of rivers and can cause a boom in food production. But in the long term, as those reservoirs in the sky disappear, that means that if you're depending on river flow to irrigate your crops, you're going to be in trouble. Meanwhile, apart from climate change, we are over pumping our underground water supplies. So you can see in, in satellite images, this is uh, showing us Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia used their oil well drilling technology to drill down deep into the desert to reach these fossil aquifers, fossil stores of water, and subsidized wheat production in the desert for many years. Until around 2009 when the government said, we're going to phase out these subsidies. We're running out of this water underneath our desert. And so we're going to stop subsidizing wheat production, stop growing food in the desert, and thus you have a country of about 30-some million people turning to the world market for the major part of their food supply. Now, Saudi Arabia is a relatively small country, but if you look throughout the Middle East, we have the, about the equivalent of a Nile River worth of water flowing into the country in terms of grain imports. So what happens as we are over pumping our water supplies in other parts of the world? The world's three major food producers, the United States, India, and China, are all seeing water tables fall because of over pumping in some of their agricultural, like, agricultural areas. In India, every single state now is seeing water tables fall in some areas because of overpumping. In the United States, it's the Ogallala Aquifer in the central United States where farmers now are abandoning some of their areas in northern Texas, parts of Kansas, because they cannot drill deep enough to get that water table, that water. Though these water sources, some water underground is replenished regularly with water, but these fossil aquifers, they're just like an oil field. And once that water is gone, you're in trouble. So looking around the world, we see overpumping happening in at least 
18 countries with over 3 billion people, maybe even close to 4 billion people dependent on water that's being overpumped. This is like, you remember the housing bubble or the stock market bubble? This is the food bubble. We can produce a lot of food now, but as we're using up our water supplies, the base of that production is being depleted. So water you drink is a very small part of our, of our water consumption. It's when you look at the water used to produce food, it gets interesting. So just a few fun facts. Um, you need about eight glasses of water to produce just nine leaves of spinach. If you want three and a half walnuts today, you better have seven gallons of water to produce it. Um, a bunch of California grapes requires 24 gallons of water to produce. Or four glasses of milk require 143 gallons of water. That's because those cows, most of them are fed grain and it takes about a thousand tons of water to produce one ton of grain. So when you start looking at meat, milk, eggs, you're looking at a lot of water use. So if you decide to eat that mere portion, 1.75 ounces of beef, you'll need 86 some gallons of water to produce it. The water demands of food are enormous. At the same time, in about a third of the world's major land areas, soil erosion is exceeding soil production. Um, a few years back, we saw a, a report coming out of China called Desert mergers and acquisitions, as deserts in the northern part of the country are actually expanding and becoming larger and larger, and that's because of overplowing, overgrazing. Um, you see roads can disappear, telephone poles, will, you'll have to attach one on top of the other as the sand dunes are moving and you want to have your power line stretch over it. And soil, of course, as we know, is, is the basis for our, our lives. Right now we have 7.5 billion people on the planet. So with current population growth rates, that means there's about 226,000 new diners at the global dinner table each night. So put all these things together, a storm is brewing. We have this tightening food supply um, while global demand is rising. Put on top of this the, the stress of climate change, and you can see humanity needs to make changes very quickly. It's not an exaggeration to say the fate of civilization is at stake. But what if, as our problems grow, so does our ingenuity. And for this, we can look at some historical examples. My longtime colleague uh, and mentor, Lester Brown, he talks about the World War II style mobilization as a historical precedent for rapid change. What can happen when a society puts its mind to do something, to work together to achieve a goal, we see that we can make rapid change, not in decades, not in years, but in a matter of months. So the attack on Pearl Harbor was on December 7th, 1941. One month later, in his addressing the United States, President Roosevelt laid forth his arms production goals. He said, we will produce 45,000 tanks, 60,000 planes, 20,000 anti-aircraft guns, and 6 million tons of merchant shipping. These were numbers no one could have comprehended before. It was hard to imagine such enormous goals, but it didn't stop there. American ingenuity got put into play and turned toy factories into compass manufacturers instead of making spark plugs the industry churned out machine guns. From early 1942 to 1944, 
Essentially, no cars were produced because all of that manufacturing capacity got put toward the war effort. Now today, the major stresses are not foreign powers. And we don't need such violent means to get ourselves out of it. There are ways to put together our common interests and solve our problems. We can do it. We can look around the world and see pieces of the puzzle everywhere. Um, a lot of it are, are things that are common sense, very simple. Empowering women, educating children, particularly girls, teaching them how to read, giving them the tools and information so that they can control the sizes of their family. If you want an example of a country that's dramatically been able to reduce its population growth rate, you can look at Iran. Iran was able to reduce birth rates from some of the highest in the world to close to levels in the United States in a very rapid period of time. And they did so largely by educating girls. The Muslim clerics were on board. Uh, they taught classes to couples before they got married, teaching them about contraception. And they were able to make rapid change. With tree planting, one of the solutions we need, you can look to examples like South Korea, that had become largely deforested. But after experiencing the problems associated with deforestation, like flooding, landslides, the country began to realize the wealth that you get from natural resources, that you get from your forests. And they were able to blanket hillsides with trees. And now you look at satellite images and you can see very sharply the line between North Korea and South Korea because South Korea is largely green. With, uh, with uh, soils, you can look at what the United States was able to do in the years stopping the Dust Bowl. Instead of overplowing and overusing our land, farmers learned how to respect the contours of the land and put in tree buffers and other things to stabilize soils. So this can be done. 